Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Commonwealth Club. I'm Lenny Mendoza. I'm a member of the Commonwealth Club's Board of Directors and a senior partner emeritus at McKinsey & Company, and I'm moderating today's discussion. It's my pleasure to introduce today's distinguished guest, P.J. O'Rourke, the noted humorist and author of his new book, None of My Business. P.J. O'Rourke's commentary and satire have earned him plaudits all around the world. Mr. O'Rourke is a contributing editor at the Weekly Standard and the H.L. Mencken Research Fellow at the Cato Institute. He's also a regular panelist on NPR's Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me, and he's editor-in-chief of the web magazine American Consequences. He lives in rural New England, which he says is about as far away you can get from things that he writes about. Mr. O'Rourke is a prolific author. He's written 19 books on subjects as diverse as politics, cars, etiquette, and economics. In this new book, None of My Business, PJ tackles the politics behind how you should conduct your business and finance. In fact, the subtitle of the book is PJ Explains Money, Banking, Debt, Equity, Assets, Liabilities, and Why He's Not Rich and Neither Are You. <laughs> It's a fabulous read with chapters like How I Learned Economics by Watching People Try to Kill Each Other, and proposals such as a 200% tax on celebrities. <laughs> Mr. O'Rourke clearly holds a unique perspective on the proper ways that we can spend our money. So please give a warm San Francisco welcome to P.J. O'Rourke. Thank you. Thank you very much. So welcome, PJ. Uh, Thank you. Cool. Always a pleasure to be at the Commonwealth Club. It's a great, been an honor a number of times in the past, and it's an honor today. Well, thank you for joining us, and look forward to a, a terrific conversation with you. Uh, and I just want to start with a little bit of context. So you've written, as we, as I mentioned, on a wide range of topics and have entertaining views on all of them. But you decided to tackle this one. So why did you decide to to write a book? on money, banking, debt, equity, assets, liabilities, and complicated things like that. Sick of politics, for one thing, <laughs> yes. I uh, wrote a, a, a book about the um, uh, 2016 election called How the Hell Did This Happen? <laughs> and uh, by the time I got done covering that election from its inception, you know, in the Pleistocene age until it finally came to, uh, came to whatever it came to in, 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 in 2016, I was really sick of politics. And for years, I've had an interest in, um, uh, I was foreign correspondent. I spent 20 years as a, well, foreign correspondent's giving it a sort of gravitas. That it didn't, I was a shithole specialist. Um, <laughs> <laughs> when everything, anything went really seriously wrong in the world, wars and insurrections, mayhem, uh, uh, rioting, uh, uh, and, and, and other sort of human misbehavior, I would go there, and uh, I did that from the, uh, uh, my first posting was in the Lebanese Civil War in, in, in the early 1980s, and I did that all the way through the Iraq War when I woke up one morning realizing I was too old to be scared stiff and too stiff to sleep on the ground, um, <laughs> and had kids at home, <laughs> and said, so, well, what was I doing here? Uh, so, but it, d during that period of, uh, of, of of being a shithole specialist and visiting a lot of shitholes, uh, I became fascinated about why they were so poor. I mean, besides the, uh, uh, the fact that they were all trying to kill each other, but also how they managed to sur to, to have an economy anyway. Uh, you, you, you know, I, I was baffled. And so it got me interested in, in economics. I wrote a book called Eat the Rich about why some countries are rich and others are poor. Uh, I wrote, uh, I actually read Adam Smith's The Wealth of Nations, uh, which is, uh, I don't recommend, uh, <laughs> very long. <laughs> and wrote a book about that uh, on the wealth of nations. And uh, so this has been a, a, a fascination of mine for a while. And I thought, what, what better time to turn away from, from politics and hatred and war and stuff and write about something really icky, <laughs> such as money. Okay, great. Well, um, as someone who learned economics in college and learned it by studying formulas and, and looking at graphs, it must be a different perspective to actually have a lens on it from what people actually do. So how is that different from what the textbooks teach us? 
Well, yeah. I mean, for one thing, I, I, had, I was an English major, or as they call it in business school, stupid. Uh, <laughs> I know nothing about business whatsoever. Uh, I still don't, uh, really, even though I wrote a book about it. I still have no, I have no idea uh, about business. I mean, best, best investment I've made lately, um, I left a $20 bill in the, in the, in the jacket of this, uh, uh, this suit. Uh, uh, when I took my wife out for dinner on, over Labor Day weekend, and I found it this morning. <laughs> so I'm not down anything. <laughs> that was a good preservation of, of wealth. Uh, and, uh, you know, that's about it. So when I arrive in Lebanon, uh, uh, besides being disoriented and terrified, uh, I, I am, uh, uh, I, I'm, not, I'm not even thinking about Lebanon having an economy at all. Uh, you know, and, and my initial plunge into Lebanon, I land at night in Beirut. Every window's been blown out of the airport. All the palm fronds have been blown off the palm trees. All the, all the, uh, the, the lamp posts in the parking lot have been run over by tanks. Uh, it's just a disaster. A uh, taxi I get into looks like it was used by Steve McQueen in The Great Escape, you know? <laughs> and just to get from the airport to downtown, to, there was an old hotel there called the Commodore Hotel that was kind of the unofficial press headquarters. And he had to go through like six or eight checkpoints of the various different warring Lebanese factions, you know. And they would stick the gun barrel in the in the window and start screaming at you. And it was uh, they scream. They were screaming. I couldn't understand what they were saying. They would say bass boat, piss pot. <laughs> and what they were trying to say was passport. <laughs> You know, P's and B's are very difficult. Uh, P's and B's are the R's and L, you know, as R's and L's are to certain Asian languages, P's and B's are to Arabic. And uh, they came, it was the one English word that every militiaman knew and no militiaman could say, you know. And so, uh, anyway, you know, I'm not thinking about this. And then uh, after a few days in Lebanon, I realized, well, of course it does have an economy or all the Lebanese who weren't dead from the Civil War, which was a considerable number of them, uh, uh, would be dead from starvation. And then I look around and I realize, well, all the shops are open, and there's traffic, and right in the middle of a war. And it's noisy, but not with the din of battle. The, the, every house and shop has a gasoline generator sitting out on the sidewalk with extension cords going every which way. And they were so loud that it that it that, it, that it drowned out all but the most all but the loudest artillery fire it was drowned out by electric generators. And I go, wow! And then I start to think about it. Of course, war is a capital-intensive activity. Guns and bullets and stuff—they're not cheap. You know? And I go, where's all this money coming from? And then I went out to the Beka Valley, which is the the the, the fertile agricultural area of of, of, of of Central Valley, of, of like Central Valley here. And I, was, I do know where the money's coming from. It's wall-to-wall -wall marijuana plants. Big, green, lush marijuana plants everywhere you could see. So that, that was, you know, they, they, they used to call Lebanon before the Civil War the Switzerland of the Middle East. It was actually the Boulder, Colorado. <laughs> <laughs> So are you sure you weren't in San Francisco driving around seeing the marijuana plants, or was that really yes. favorite? Yes, <laughs> that, yeah, that was earlier and then later. But the economy really did work. There's still transactions happen. So were they using Venmo or cryptocurrency, <laughs> no, or how no. did they? Well, I th you know, one th economic disaster, of course, that war always causes is the Lebanese currency was worthless. And, uh, but that didn't stop the Lebanese for a moment. I mean, they, they were way out ahead of this. They were doing business in every conceivable hard currency that they could find, French francs, English pounds, U.S. dollars. And little kids, kids selling cigarettes on the street could tell you the international exchange rate every day. <laughs> and they were totally aware of this. Yeah. Well, that's one way to keep it flowing. Yes. So I, I want to talk a little bit about uh, some of the topics you cover in, in the book. And so one of them was... Uh, investment scams, and we don't have investment scams anymore. No, we don't. Yeah. Now we're, <laughs> we, we fixed that. But, <laughs> yeah. What, you, yeah. you have a view about what they're like, so what, what are investment scams? Yeah, I learned a, a real core lesson about investment scams in Albania. Uh, I went to Albania, I ain't trying to remember when it was, 1997, I think. The, the whole of Albanian economy had collapsed because of pyramid schemes. They, 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 they were, you know, there was greater fool theory at work. You know, uh, uh, pyramid scheme guys 
the Bernie Madoffs of Albania. So sort of cross Bernie Madoff with an armed John Belushi, and you get kind of a, <laughs> who was Albanian, incidentally. Uh, 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 is, uh, you get kind of a picture of what the, the uh, a very unfunny John Belushi was, be, so, uh, what, the, what the country was like. And so I take the last remaining flight from Italy. There's like one weekly flight, and there's one hotel left in Albania, and they send a driver and a driver and translator. And uh, I, I go out trying to figure out how this happened. So what, what had gone on was that the pyramid scheme guys had offered foolishly high returns uh, and people foolishly put their money in there. And th that foolish money was paid off with the money from yet more foolish people who came in later, which in turn was paid off by uh, 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 more foolish people yet. And... Um, uh, you know, the greater fool theory would tell us this could go on forever. And greater fool theory is, is a bedrock of economics. Not the kind you studied, but the kind <laughs> I studied. Uh, it, it's just, the greater fool theory is that no matter how stupid I am, there's somebody dumber out there. You know? <laughs> and they'll buy what I've got to sell. So, but math would tell us that this doesn't actually work because if you if a if pyramid scheme grows exponentially, say 10, 10 squared, 10 to the third power, um, it takes only about uh, uh, 10 iterations uh, uh, of that exponential expansion to include two and a half times the population of Earth. So, you know, this is, this is what happened to Bernie Madoff. You know? yep. He's going, I got, I got practically everybody, but not, not quite, and um, it all collapsed. So, of course, it did collapse. And, um, you know, people in the United States were angry when Bernie Madoff's uh, 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 scheme collapsed. This is nothing compared to how angry the Albanians were. Like I say, <laughs> armed John Belushi. <laughs> Rioting broke out everywhere. Troops were told to, you know, all public assemblies were banned. Troops were told to fire on the rioters. The troops deserted because they all had money in the, uh, 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 in the pyramid schemes, too. They looted the arsenal of Albania, which, because it had been controlled by Stalinist lunatics for, for many, many years, was huge. There were, oh, it was something like 1.5 million guns and machine guns and uh, rifles and so on in the uh, uh, military. And there, were, there was like, like 1.5 billion rounds of ammunition and they stole the heavy weapons too there was a bank that got robbed by a tank <laughs> and then the, then the, the rioting just turned into vandalism and the vandalism and looting and, and the place just completely fell apart and I thought you know this, there's a country here that has been dis basically destroyed by a chain letter <laughs> well what <laughs> so like I say I flew over there it took me half an hour to find out what had gone on. Uh, I stayed for a little while longer because it was very entertaining. <laughs> but, but it took me half an hour to get my story, basically. The translator took me to a newspaper. The newspaper took me to the newspaper editor who spoke English. I asked the newspaper editor. I said, OK, what? How did all the people in Albania get suckered into this, this pyramid schemes? I said, were they just, after all those years of communist rule, were they just innocent uh, and, and, and ignorant of how money and investment were? He said, no, no, not at all. He said, there have been pyramid schemes all over post-communist Europe, and most of them had failed before the Albanian pyramid schemes began. He said they realized that pyramid schemes don't work. He said all the people who invest in the pyramid schemes assumed that this kind of return on money could not possibly be made by anything legal, that this must have to do with drugs and money laundering and prostitution and, uh, uh, and, and, and theft uh, uh, of things from all over Europe. And he said, you know, the people of Albania, don't, they didn't think they were victims of pyramid schemes. They thought they were perpetrators. And therein lies the secret wow. of all pyramid schemes. <laughs> okay. Um, well, a little closer to home, there's a, and I know you're, you're not a registered investment advisor, you're a registered No, I'm not. No, I, yeah. I, I don't even play one on TV. <laughs> <laughs> but there are a number of people now who are, and it's particularly in this part of the world, enamored of the opportunities in cryptocurrency. Whew. You know, the very first, I don't have to tell you, I'm sure you, t you have told a number of people uh, uh, in your life, that the very before you ever do anything with your money, before you give your money to anybody else in return for their making money with that money, you figure out how are they making this money. I have a good, uh, my investment advisor, as a matter of fact, at least said that ignorance saved my ass. 
He said, I was really looking to put some money into Enron because it was hot. You know, back in about 2000, Fortune magazine had named Enron the most innovative country, uh, company in the world. And he said, I called in my analyst. And uh, he, said, uh, uh, he said, I told my analyst, I said, get out there and do some digging on Enron and get right back to me because I think this is hot. And a week goes by, nothing from his analyst. He calls him on the carpet. He says, you know, what's going on? So, you know, we're still working on it. Another week goes by, nothing. What's going on? We're still working on it. Month goes by, and he calls all his analysts on the carpet, and he says, month ago, I told you about this hot tip on Enron, and I asked you to go do your due diligence, and I haven't heard nothing from you. And his chief analyst said, Mike, do you remember what you told us when you hired us? He says, no. <laughs> he said, you told us <laughs> that the first thing you do in analyzing a company is figure out how they make their money. And we have been looking at Enron. We've got half a dozen people looking at Enron for a month, and we can't figure out how they're making their money. And of course, about five minutes later, the whole thing comes crashing down. And uh, I would say the same. See, cryptocurrency is an invention of the evil high school math club. <laughs> Uh, with, with, with weaponized slide rules. You know? <laughs> and right now, there's some, some, some pear-shaped 15-year-old is in his mother's basement wearing emoji pajamas, you know. <laughs> Floor is covered with Snickers wrappers, and he's making himself a darknet billionaire uh, <laughs> on, on, the, uh, on the crypto. Yeah, if you don't understand it, go, don't go anywhere near it. And with the, with the, with the, 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 the pear-shaped nerd, I, I'm, I'm hoping... Walgreens accepts cryptocurrency in, uh, in payment for acne cream. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's great. Um, you know, you devoted a, a pretty substantial portion of the book talking about the digital age and the internet and what it's doing to the world um, without giving away all of the secrets in the book. Yeah. Can you give us a, a little... Uh, well, no, no offense to this, you know, epicenter of the digital revolution, but... Whose bright idea was it to put every idiot in touch with every other idiot? <laughs> you know, <laughs> I, you know I, uh, I, I know that the digital revolution is, all, is all doing all sorts of marvelous things, and the computers are absolutely marvelous things, and there are probably, me included, a lot of people in this room who wouldn't be alive today if it weren't for the computer abilities uh, you know, behind modern medicine and so on and so forth. But uh, when it comes to like its offshoots, like social media, I, I, I'm just appalled. And I've got teenage daughters. And so I was talking to one of my, the elder of my teenage daughters, and I said, I expected some vivid defense of uh, social media from her. And she said, no, it's terrible, Dad. This is terrible. He said, I wish I could stop using it. I wish I could get unentangled from this. She said, what it's like, what social media is like, it's like having a sleepover with everyone you know, whether you like them or not. They are all at your house for a sleepover, and they won't go home. <laughs> so, yeah, I found skepticism even at the core market with, with social media. We wish we could be free of the thing, you know. But we're not, so it's here to stay. Well, is it here to stay? And that's, that was something that was kind of interesting to talk to the kids about because um, the, these are things, are, I mean, Facebook is not really a corporation that makes anything. It's a corporation, it, it is a fad, a fashion. Now, fashion trends can last for a long time, uh, but there, there's no core product there. And if enough people like my teenage daughter change their mind about this, and in some ways they have, she, I said, well, what's with Facebook? And she said, Facebook? It's so old. <laughs> Facebook's for old people. She said, well, we'll use Facebook because it's like the community bulletin board. So, you know, if we're having like a, uh, a demonstration at school, and of course they are, you know, because uh, <laughs> that's what kids at school do, uh, uh, we'll put it up on Facebook because that way it reaches everybody. But you wouldn't actually communicate with anybody on Facebook because that's for grandmas, you know. <laughs> so, so this can change so fast, and there's nothing, there are no physical assets there in place to slow down the pace of change. There's no, there's no Facebook factory, you know, the unionized factory workers saying, wait a minute, you can't just fire us all, you owe us for our pension plans. They're not, they're not there. You know? <laughs> okay. Um, you talk as well about the mutations of capitalism and how we've got mutant capitalists and people that are doing weird things. So what, what 
I'm yeah. not that I was, I, that was not a segue from Facebook. That was just a, well, no, but I mean, it could be, I mean, okay. The richest person in the world ever, Jeff Bezos. What, what, what does he do? It's a glorified yard sale, you know? <laughs> Uh, it doesn't actually produce anything, you know, it just moves stuff around. And, you know, somebody's going to come along and figure out how to move stuff around faster than he is sooner or later. You know, just like, you know, Sears used to move stuff around too, and where are they today, you know? So it's it, 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 it puzzling, what, what puzzles me not is, is not so much this aspect of the economy, it's the valuation of this aspect of the economy. When I look at the stock prices for these FANG stocks, and I see what the PE is, never mind doing any deeper analysis, just like the most shallow possible uh, economic analysis you could do if price earnings and, and some of these companies don't even earn anything and then many of them of course to what extent they do earn something they're not distributing the profits it's all kind of Albanian looking there isn't it <laughs> <laughs> I own this I, own, I invested in this company because its stock is worth a lot of money it doesn't pay me any dividends and you know I'm not even sure if it makes a profit but the stock is very valuable, and I'm going to sell it to somebody stupider than me for even more than what I paid it for it, you know? That, worries me. That, that seems to work for a little while. Until it it works for a while, yeah. All, you know, lots of things work for a while. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so you uh, wrote this book, and you've been out talking about it for a little while, and people, I'm sure, are coming up into you and saying, okay, that, that, that makes sense. So now where do I put my money? What yeah, yeah. If I knew that, I would be too rich to have written this book. <laughs> I got absolutely no idea, but I, I, I but I really, I, 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 I don't. I mean, I, I would give the advice that everybody gives on, on on investment, which is basically to to mimic what Warren Buffett does, which is deep analysis of the fundamentals of a corporation, which is boring and tiresome, and also the fact that we have an information system out there where the noise to signal ratio is extremely high makes it, I think, actually, even though there's more information about corporations and investments out there than there ever has been before, it's very hard to sort that information. I think there was a time 30 or 40 years ago where a sort of strict Buffettian uh, uh, analysis uh, of a company was, uh, am, I, am I way off base? No, or? no, no, I'm, you're, you're the registered expert now. <laughs> but I'm so not. I'm no, no, no. I'm self-admitted in my ignorance, which, as <laughs> my, my financial investor, Michael Farr, pointed out, uh, had saved him a lot of money, and I'm hoping it's saving me a lot of money to be very ignorant. Um, okay. That's great. So um, we have a lot of fans in the audience, and the questions are coming in, uh, and I'm going to migrate to those in just a second. But I okay. want to ask you a little bit of transition about, you were writing about business and economics and markets as part, as you said, I know you weren't totally joking, to get away from the mess that's yeah, going on right, in politics. Yeah. But those things aren't independent. No, they? they're not. No. So how does what's going on in Washington influence your view about about business and economics? Well, let's even back up a little bit from what goes going on in Washington and talk about an even more fundamentally political side of economics is that... Um, uh, one of the reasons that it's so hard to give any coherent investment advice, not just because I don't know anything, but even if I did know something, it would be hard to do, is that you cannot get a reasonable rent for your money at the moment. I mean, you go deposit your money in someplace dead safe, you know, as safe as you can find, as you know, an insured savings account, uh, a T-bill, whatever. Uh, you essentially are not keeping up with with inflation. I mean, you you are at zero or possibly even negative. Uh, return for your money. Now, the and this is a political creation. This is this is a central bank, not just our central bank, but all basically all the central banks in the world have decided to print fiat money when they feel like it. And fiat money is money that is money that it's there for what I call the um, uh, uh, the, the 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 lousy parent reason. Uh, the government, you know, it's just like we say to our kids because we're lousy parents. We say because I said so, and that's what the value of money is set. It's not pegged in gold. It's not pegged in silver. It's there because I, the government said it's there. You go to the treasury with a $10 bill, they'll give you $10. They'll give you two in singles. They'll give you two fives. They'll give you quarters, pennies, if you like. They will not give you anything else. They will not give you anything of substance for that. Ten, $10 is worth $10, whatever that may be worth at the moment. So when you have a, a situation 
where interest rates have been lowered so much by central banks that you have an asset that you are expected to rent for nothing or less than nothing. I mean, imagine having a nice house and you want to rent it and, the, and, and, and a real estate agent comes and says, well, I can get you nothing for your rent or, or a little less than that. <laughs> And you'd be going, wait a minute. <laughs> well, that's the situation with your money at the moment. And it drives, of course, it drives people in, in, in seeking even a modest return. It drives them into fairly risky behavior, which I do not think. So that's one political aspect. And then, of course, the fact the government just cannot keep its hands off the economy. You know, I, I mean, it, it, was, it used to be it just taxed it. Okay, that was bad, but it was, you know, we understood, you know, I mean, it, obviously government has to pay the rent too, you know, so, you know, they tax. But it, over the years, starting back in the 1930s, the government has been uh, uh, convinced that it really knows what we should buy and sell and how much we should buy and sell it for better than we do. And so it's been on a, a you know, an 80-year track of, uh, I can't even blame this on FDR, it was actually, this, this was started under the Hoover administration uh, before, even before the crash of 29, um, the government was getting involved in farm prices. And uh, so then if you have a situation where a maniac is running the government, uh, and I'm not saying that's the case, I'm just you know, throwing <laughs> that out there as a possibility. <laughs> And the people who oppose the maniac uh, are completely disassociated from reality on, uh, on economic terms, like don't understand ec anything about economics. That's a bad situation. You know. uh, where it will go, though, I don't know. So um, I'm going to try and bridge a little bit to some of the questions we're getting from sure. the audience. So, uh, and this one's the, the bridging question. So you were researching finance topics and kind of how the markets work for the last while. Has that given you a different view on government corruption and money? Not to connect this to the current administration or anything, but... Right. No. Well, actually, you know, I mean, it's... Yeah, corruption comes in, in lots of different forms. Uh, yeah. Uh, the thing about... Uh, uh, to understand government... Uh, you, you, you have to understand markets in general, and the, and the key to understanding markets in general is that everybody is looking to profit. Everybody's in it for something. The profit motive cannot be erased from human beings. Sorry, Marx. Sorry, Lenin. Sorry, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. It just can't. You can't get rid of the profit motive. But you have to be wide awake to realize what currency people are trading in. Not everybody is in it for the money. Most of us sensible, normal people are in it for the money, but not everybody. Some people are in it for power. And I would rather deal with people who are greedy for money than people who are greedy for power. Because, you know, money's not zero sum. More money can be made, or in the case of the central banks, printed at any rate. But power you know, po power you lose to somebody is power that they have over you. Power is zero sum. It's not like I, it's not like like the marketplace where you know if I have too many slices of pizza, you don't have to eat the pizza box. You know, we can make more pizza, uh, but we we can't make more power. Some people are in it for power. Some are in it for fame. Uh, some and these are not mutually exclusive categories. Some are are, are in it to, to to have a ferocious, angry, uh, fearful reputation. Uh, even the good people, even the virtuous people, are looking to profit. Even, you know, when I was out being a war correspondent, even the, the aid workers and the peacemakers, were, they were building up treasure in heaven. You know, I mean, they, they, they too were looking for, for, for a profit. So you have to include the profit motive in everything. So when you analyze government, it was, it was actually uh, uh, James Buchanan, the economist, the, the, the public choice theory, it's called. Well, you have to analyze. So say a government, a, there's a kind of government corruption that doesn't have anything to do with money. There are corrupt po powers within the bureaucracy looking to expand their power, their purview, their, their, their influence, the size of their staff, even if they don't get an extra cent out of it. You always have to keep your eye on, on, on that kind of thing. Okay. Um, 
Someone said they saw you give a talk 35 years ago. You must have been in kindergarten or something. Yes, exactly. But, um, <laughs> I wasn't born yet. <laughs> yeah. how, how have things changed as you've been observing the world? What's different now than what it was when you were first? I am observing? a bunch older and more tired of it. <laughs> Does the world really ever change? You know, I mean, yes, uh, manifestations of human nature change, but human nature itself, I don't, I, I don't think changes much. And, you know, 35, well, there seems to be, as, as I, if a glance at the television this morning indicates uh, anything, there seems to be a, a kerfluffle going on about what happened 35 years ago and whether things have changed since then, um, about which I have absolutely no opinion because I have absolutely no information. I have no idea what, what uh, uh, went on at, at, at Georgetown Prep uh, a generation ago. Uh, but, no, I don't, think, I don't think things have really fundamentally changed. Fashions and fads change, but okay. people don't. And is it as fun being out writing and talking today as it was 35 years ago, or are people still engaged and interesting and interested? It's a little tough at the moment because people are so angry. And, you know, the only value that humor has at all is to give one some distance on things. Humor is a way of stepping back from things and looking at the larger picture and going, haven't people always been goofs? Isn't everybody pretty much a goof? Isn't it all fairly goofy? Because if you get right up front on things, you get absolutely furious and sometimes you get killed. Um, or, or you kill somebody else. You know? and, and so detachment is really what's, what's behind humor. And I would say... It was probably easier to be detached uh, 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 30 years ago uh, than it is to be uh, detached now. But the other thing is, I'm older, so and with that, well, a lot of grief comes from being older. More detachment, definitely. The passion goes away, and that's a good thing. Okay. Uh, in addition to to uh, writing and, and doing your shows. You also are uh, engaged in the, a little bit in the thought leadership world on, and thinking about you know, serious topics, but engaged in a way that, that entertain people as well as informing them. So what ideas, if any, are you excited about these days that you think are kind of interesting that people ought to be paying attention to? I haven't seen one lately, <laughs> I swear. In fact, I think we're at kind of a low ebb with the ideas that excite me personally. I mean, I'm a libertarian. First and foremost, philosophically, I'm a libertarian. Uh, libertarian is not really a political position. It's more of an attitude. It's an attitude toward the individual. And I believe in individuals uh, because that's all we got. You know, I mean, everybody is an individual, and if we don't have some faith in them, uh, you know, what, what are we going to do? And so uh, it's individual, individual dignity, individual liberty, and individual responsibility. Uh, now, almost everybody's down with two out of three of those. The responsibility, <laughs> a little bit less so. And uh, at the moment, uh, uh, I think because we are engaged, uh, deeply engaged in angry causes, uh, some sight has been lost. This has been a really painful period for the libertarians. The, uh, uh, the current administration has absolutely nothing of any libertarian nature to it whatsoever. And the opposition to it has, has almost as little. Uh, uh, they're a little better on, 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 on the human dignity and a little better on some aspects of, of, of human liberty. Uh, but, but, fundament but they're fundamentally, you know, if you're a leftist, you're fundamentally opposed to the idea of individual responsibility. It's all about collective responsibility. So it's been, it's been grim days uh, uh, for anybody of a libertarian turn of mind. Okay. Um, we, of course, given the fans and the audience have some political questions. Can we go to a couple of those? Yeah, I don't care. You know, why not? You know, everybody else is. <laughs> what, you know, why should we be special? All right. So do you, uh, do you have any predictions on what's, what's the end game for Donald Trump? Uh, no, I, 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 well, I, I think that the, that the Republicans are going to experience pretty big defeat in the midterm elections. And I think that's going to be a case of be careful what you wish for, uh, because the, the government, which is pretty divided now, will then become radically divided. 
in some libertarian theory, uh, 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 that might not be a bad thing because what libertarians would like government to do less, and when it's paralyzed by, 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 by dispute, it, 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 in theory, could, could do less. Although, uh, it's been in my experience when our government is radically divided between, say, well, let's call it right and left. When it's divided between right and left, they, 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 they don't manage to be able to agree on anything but the worst possible ideas. You know, while one side will have a set of bad ideas and the other side has another set of bad ideas, and they're in terrible opposition with, between these two bad ideas, uh, sets of bad ideas, they will settle on something god-awful <laughs> that's in the middle. Uh, and so, I, 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 so if my prediction comes true and the, and the Republicans uh, receive a, I may say, pretty well deserved defeat in the midterm elections, then there will be an impeachment and the impeachment, historically speaking, probably won't be successful. Uh, but what we don't know for sure whether it'll be successful, we do know for sure that it will drag on forever. You know? And it puts the person that everybody's mad at, or not everybody, but enough you know, half the nation, more than half the nation, is very mad at. Unfortunately, this is somebody who wants attention of any kind. Everybody in this audience who's raised a toddler knows this person's <laughs> psychological makeup. If they can get attention by being adorable and saying cute things, great. If they can't, they'll grab the tail of the cat, you know? I mean, because bad attention, good attention, they don't really have it sorted out in their mind. What the, the attention is attention, you know? And, 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 and like, while it's, uh, uh, it's great to be cooed over and praised, getting yelled at is interesting too, you know? So what we're gonna do is this, this person, this unnamed person who's already at the center of all this kerfluffle is going to become far more at the center, and he's going to love it. He's going to absolutely love it. Uh, and, and, you know, the only way to, to chase this person out of office would, would really would, would, would be for him to get bored with it. And as long as people are paying attention, whether that attention is lav praiseful, praiseful or, 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 or bitterly scornful, um, he's in heaven. That sounds like a great next couple of years. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. You wonder why I'm a little gloomy yeah. about this stuff. Yeah. It reminds me of an investment advice that someone said to me that the best day to put money in the marketplace is when there's snow in Washington because no one <laughs> operates. And the media is not their cover. It comes to a complete stop. A complete stop. Yeah. So uh, someone did ask, and I have to ask you, why'd you vote for Hillary? Yeah, that was a tough one because I really don't like the woman. Uh, I, 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 uh, 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 but it was, you know... My, it came down for me uh, to, and we had big conversation, and my wife and I had big conversation about this. We actually lived in a state where your vote happens to matter. Uh, we live in New Hampshire, and it actually is a swing state. So it was not a foregone conclusion, as it might have been here, for instance. It wasn't a foregone conclusion who would win the, 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 um, uh, the electoral college vote uh, from our state. So we couldn't just, like, protest vote, you know, or, 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 or throw our vote away, or write in uh, a Jeb Bush, or whatever it was, you know, we might have done. Uh, we, ha we actually had some responsibility a as voters, and, um, I, I, you know, I looked at this guy, and I just thought, I, yeah, you know, I, uh, 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 he's a toddler, you know, and do we want to make a toddler? The, would, you, would you give the button to a toddler, you know? Because it'd be interesting to push it, right? You know, so, you know. And I thought, I consider Hillary Clinton to be wrong about everything, but she's wrong within normal parameters. <laughs> Eight years of Obama, I'm used to it, you know, I, I've, I've figured out my coping mechanisms, so in the end, I pulled the Hillary lever. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, so this is a, a more of a, a serious question around, at what point does becoming detached from the environment become apathy? And what, what, do, you, what do you have any thoughts on how do you prevent apathy as opposed to people just saying, throw up your hands, this is just impossible. Well, a apathy is an aspect of despair. And detachment is not an aspect of dis despair, it's an, a it's an aspect of perspective. 
Uh, and I don't think there's anything dangerous about trying to get perspective, historical perspective, psychological perspective, sociological perspective on questions. I, I don't think that the, that the two, but uh, 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 I, I do think that apathy is one of a, a very understandable, like anger, apathy uh, uh, is a very understandable reaction to, to a situation for which you don't see any immediate fix. And I think when you're faced with a situation you don't see any immediate fix for, remember, this situation won't endure forever. All situations are temporary. And so when it comes time to, for, for another situation, you want to have your head straight about what you, you, you don't want to simply react violently uh, to the situation that you don't like. You want to have a, a set of parameters in place for the next situation that comes along, lest you trade one bag of snakes for another. Uh, and so, I, yeah, I don't think there's anything apathetic about detachment. Okay. Um, we had a couple questions around more uh, business and economics related topics. So one is around, how do you think about the banking system? Are they evil? Are they people too hard on them? Are they overregulated? What, what do you think about banks? Well, it's, you know, because we have this, this, this politically created money, um, it's actually hard to blame the bankers for how they have to deal with this. And it's also, it doesn't lend itself to an easy solution. You can't really go back on the gold standard had its own problems. And also the very idea of that there should be some basis for currency. You know, gold was really nothing but a sort of a fad and a fashion, a very long lasting one. Uh, that, 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 you know, gold comes from a time when, when shiny, unblemished things, people included, were very rare. And, and, and a new generation may arise that, that, that considers gold to be vulgar and wrong, the way millennials consider veal, you know? I, you don't know. Um, there probably is a theoretical solution to this, a sort of market basket basis for, 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 for currency valuations. But, it's, but, but politicians have so much fun playing with the currency that, that it's very hard to imagine politicians doing that. And so I, I don't actually think that our banking system does such a bad job given the flawed tools that, that it has to work, work with. Regulation, uh, you know, the, the, the most important regulation you can have in finance, uh, for, from my point of view, is transparency. The more honest information that is available about what's going on in the market, that's much better than a regulatory agency, because a regulatory agency is always going to be outgunned. Regulatory agency is going to pay like their lawyers maybe a hundred grand a year, and the corporations are going to pay their lawyers a million dollars a year. Now, what kind of lawyer, you know, I mean, there may be some brilliant lawyers that only want to make a hundred thousand dollars a year. Maybe, you know, but I mean, on average, what kind of lawyer are you going to get for, for, for the price that you pay? And so the regulatory agencies are always going to be outsmarted uh, by the... And also, what's in it for the... Uh, we go back to the profit motive. What's, what's in it for that regulator? Uh, a little prestige, small promotion, maybe a big job in the private sector Well, he'll be attacking his fellow reg regulators, whereas a lot is on the line for the corporations being regulated, and they will put their resources behind uh, the, their attacks. So, so insistence on transparency, I think, is, 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 it tends to be more effective than an insistence on regulation. Okay. Well, we can't be in San Francisco without someone asking a question of this vein. So um, at what point do robots take all of our jobs? <laughs> and it can't come too soon for me. <laughs> uh, yeah, right. Do we really like our jobs all that well? You know? I mean, as long as they'll keep paying us, the robot is, ha you know, let it go, let it rip. You know? I suppose they won't keep paying us, though. That's the, that, that is the problem. No, I think it's going to actually be a while. Um, we all have, uh, uh, except for you know those of us who, who have ducked out of this with vintage vehicles, we all have a bunch of robots at our command in our car. How well does that work? You know, I mean, 
Yesterday, uh, 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 Dave and I uh, uh, here were, were, were driving around doing you know, various PR dates, and we got stuck on the Bay Bridge uh, for about three I'm hours. <laughs> I know, I know this comes as, a, as a, some sort of huge surprise to anyone in this room. <laughs> we're stuck on the Bay Bridge, and we are trying to make a phone call with voice commands. Get out of here. You know? I don't know what language that lady speaks that's in that box, but it's in English, you know. He goes, you know, three, because well, we're, we're trying to call ahead to say that we're going to be late, you know. We're going, three, five, six, and it goes, V, V, or X, you know. And it's, uh, so we all know how robots work, and, uh, you know, they, they, and anybody who's backed over the bicycle while staring in the screen, listening to all the beeps and stuff, you know. I knocked out the beeper on the back of my, I got a Chevy Suburban, I knocked the beeper back I not, uh, by backing into a tree. <laughs> the beeper warning thing. <laughs> Why did I do that? Uh, it's not just because I'm stupid. It's because the thing had been lying to me. It had been lying to me for years. Every time I would back up over, you know, and the grass was long behind the car, the beeper would go off. So the beeper went off one more time, and but this time it was telling this little it was a little beeper that cried tree, you know? <laughs> and I hit it. So we shouldn't be worried about robots writing books anytime soon. I don't think so. No, yeah, they'd be very roboty books. Okay, so a couple more questions from fans. So, do you think? Drunk, stoned, brilliant, dead was fair and accurate from what you can remember? You know, I didn't see it. This is a movie about, Drunk, Stone, Brilliant, Brilliant Dead was a movie about the, is a movie about the National Lampoon where I was for many years in which I ran uh, uh, at, at the end of the 70s, beginning of the 80s. And I, it just, I, I, you know, a lot of those people that were, as in the title, a number of them are dead. It was just too sad. I didn't want to go back to all that. It was, uh, it was fun while it lasted. And, uh, you know, I sort of felt like watching that movie would be sort of like going back to college, you know. And, like, I think I'm, I, I, I'm getting a little too old for the fraternity initiation, you know. Okay. So forget the movie, but what was it like at that time there? Uh, it wasn't much fun, actually. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, the National Lampoon, and I think this is probably you, you could get the same answer out of Saturday Night Live writers and so on, is that uh, you really don't want a whole bunch of, uh, of humorists uh, and comedians in one place at one time. It's like having a, it's like having a sack full of cats. Uh, <laughs> won't really get along. And it was like the inverse of a usual job. You know, a usual job is the job is a pain in the neck. You know, the, the work is, 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 nobody likes the work. But you kind of like the job because you go and see your friends, you know, and you gossip and flirt and stuff like that, you know, and it gives you something to do in the middle of the day. So the job's kind of cool. The work sucks, you know, but the job's kind of fun. <laughs> Lampoon was the exact opposite. The work was fun, you know. We had enormous fun, just you know, ripping everything to shreds and making fun of everybody in the world. The work was lots of fun. The 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 the, the job was horrible because you you know you got to you had to come into the office and visit the sack full of cats. You know? <laughs> okay. <laughs> job of visiting a cat full of sacks. That doesn't sound like a lot no, of fun. I know. So, um, so do your children read your books, and what do they? Say? No. No, my children don't read my books. Uh, they, uh, I, I, I've got a good friend, Andy Ferguson, who's a wonderful writer. He writes for uh, uh, the Weekly Standard mostly uh, and, and a number of other places. But anyway, Andy's a brilliant guy. And, and uh, Andy's kids uh, are a little older than my kids. And when my kids were little and his kids were teens, I asked Andy, I said, okay, your kids are teens now. What are you telling them about drugs? What are you telling them specifically? What are you telling them about you and drugs? Because they're going to ask, you know. And Andy said, I never touched them. <laughs> never touched drugs. Dad went, never went anywhere near drugs. That picture of Dad with the uh, hair down to his butt that's, you know, on, on, on the shelf over there. I, I, I was in a, a folk rock band. We did folk masses. <laughs> never, drugs, evil, bad, wrong, Dad never did them. I said, Andy... You've written about doing You lived out here in San Francisco in the 70s. You've written about, you know, sort of days in the haze, you know. <laughs> and he says, you know, PJ, you can't trust the, anything that you write in your life. It's going to pop up someplace later. You can never get rid of it. You know, you can trust, you, you can't trust anybody not to accept your kids. Your kids will never read a word you've written. <laughs> 
They, you know, they've heard enough of you around the house. You know? So that's been my experience with that. Okay, and um, so I'm sure they didn't read them then, but they must know about what you write about. What do, what do they think of what you do for a living? They think I'm boring and old. <laughs> like I, don't, I don't think it really, you know, it, that, that it relates, you know. Uh, uh, it, it's, you know, you just, it, it is like, if we think back about this, and we've all been through this thing, how invisible parents are to their children. Do you remember when it, when it first occurred to you, probably not until you were in your middle 20s, that your parents had sex? <laughs> Ew! <laughs> Ew! I remember that actually occurring to me, and, and, and actually thinking twice, right? And once, once for me. You know. <laughs> My sisters are twins, so I was confused about this for a little bit. I gone, did they do it just twice, or did they have to do it two and a half times? <laughs> I, 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 uh, I, I, but, but parents are just invisible to people, and what parents do is largely invisible okay. to, to, to kids. So you've been out talking about your your book and getting a chance to interact with a lot of different people across the country. Um, when they're not asking you questions about their book, your book, what's on their minds? What, what do you find interesting on what people are talking about these days? Yeah, well, it's been, you know, really, really politicized. And I, I think that is just a bad thing. And I think that it's a bad thing, not because there you know, aren't political fights to be fought, not because of who's right and who's wrong, I just think that, that, that moving all sorts of categories of life into the political is a dangerous thing to do. And the reason uh, I think that is because the entry, le entry bar into politics is so low that it is always going to make wrong decisions, and wrong decisions are going to be made by idiots. Think about the other, now politicians are very important in our life. They have enormous power over our existence. You know, they create the parking rules. You know, they, they create the tax laws. They create all sorts of things. You know, they tried to, I remember when they tried to draft me, tried to drag me off to some place with noxious flora and fauna and, and, and shoot people that I didn't even know. And, and, and what's more, they were expected to shoot back. Uh, I hated that idea. I was having a good time. It was the 60s. <laughs> Um, so you think about all the other people that are, are, think about your investment advisor, think about your doctor, think about your lawyer, think about your, your priest, your minister, your man. They all have to climb over a pretty high threshold to get the, the, the level of authority that they exercise. And then what do politicians have to do to get the level of authority they exercise, which is actually a lot more than your lawyer or your doctor or your financial advisor or your minister? They have to eat a lot of spaghetti dinners, you know, in the middle of the afternoon with people they don't like in places they wouldn't normally be. That's the threshold to become a politician. <laughs> you want to turn large parts of your life over to a system run by people willing to eat spaghetti dinners in the middle of the day <laughs> in places that they hate to go with people that they don't like uh, uh, just in order to become a politician. So yeah, anything that, that can avoid being politicized should be, should be. Okay, and so people, um, you can't get on a, turn on your news in the morning without seeing politics when it starts, but there's still a lot of other things going on in the world that that are more entertaining or fun or exciting, whether it's, you know, okay, I can't think of anything. But so. Yeah, I've reached the age where that would be staying home. <laughs> yeah, would be, yeah, sleeping in in the morning, that's good, you know. Uh, staying home, that's, that, that's nice, you know. Not ever getting on an airplane again. They can't come, that, that teleporting thing can't come too fast. I just, you know. Uh, this, is, this is not the world's youngest audience here. Remember when it was actually exciting? To fly, <laughs> people got dressed up, <laughs> and I was, you know, they had food. <laughs> okay, so um, you had some other portions of your book that talked about bigger topics that are in the news today that aren't aren't necessarily political, but are interact with decisions like trade and tariffs and things like that. What do you have a perspective on what's happening to trade and what the role of China and going to be in all of this? Yeah, a little bit. I mean, the th one thing is that, that if, if you study economics at all, you begin to realize that fundamentally, 
free trade is at the core of any kind of prosperity. I mean, Adam Smith had, 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 had three basic principles, uh, uh, which was self-interest. Adam Smith realized that the profit motive, as I was talking about it in its largest definition, was absolutely central to all human beings. And then specialization, which was, you know, basically the concept of uh, you learn to do something and you have to distribute the, the doings of things. You can't do everything. I mean, he used the, 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 the example of a pen, or Milton Friedman used the example of a pencil. Something as simple as a pencil would require you to be a graphite miner, a lumberjack, you know, run a, a, a you know, uh, to have a facility with, to grow rubber trees, to have a facility with spray paint, you know, to get the yellow on the outside. It'd be impossible for any one of us in this room to make a pencil or a pin. Uh, we couldn't do it. And so you have to have this specialization. And then for, in order for the specialization to work in a way that, 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 that fulfills people's self-interest, you have to trade. And so trade is, by its nature, not, not only is it necessary to ec any economic growth or any economic well-being even, uh, uh, but it's also part and parcel of our rights. Uh, our freedoms, if we were not allowed to trade, our freedoms are being limited. Uh, our economic freedoms are being severely limited, which in turn limits our, our personal. So I'm a free trade guy. Now, does free trade cause distortions and does free, is free trade, uh, uh, you know, is it liable to, to, to various kinds of, of government corruptions? Uh, do the Chinese agree to allow American imports and then say, oh, oh, except for, 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 except for black and white pigs, you're not allowed to bring those in because those are forbidden under this, that, or the other thing, or, you know, um, uh, you're, you're, you violated this idea or you violated that idea or so on. So we're going to say you can trade, you can bring it, import anything from the United States, but no, no, you can't import that computer because it might be able to connect to other computers and, you know, people would have freedom of information, which we don't want over here in China, that kind of thing. So do these things have to be fought out and argued out? They do. Is Trump doing this in a way that, that I think of as sane trade negotiation? No. But then it brings up the larger question of Trump, the kind of unanswerable question of Trump, is that uh, uh, to, what, to what extent is, is this guy a Venn diagram here? Is he crazy? Is he crazy like a fox? Or is he crazy like Fox News? <laughs> <laughs> and that, that's not mutually exclusive, you know, those, those, those Venn diagrams overlap, you know, and uh, so, hey, what if we wake up tomorrow and China says, okay, okay, we surrender, you know, you can import whatever you want over here, you know, we're going to live up to our trade agreements because, and you know, there's a possibility for that interesting story in the New York Times yesterday, the Chinese would like to retaliate, but they don't import enough of our stuff to retaliate on. <laughs> They're like out of retaliation, you know. <laughs> So I guess they could go like bomb the Spratly Islands, you know, or something, you know, and upset us in another way. But or you know, but but you know, what if what if this this mad tactic that that, that he's using, what if it actually works? It, it, it's possible, but you know, it's certainly not the way that uh, most of economics. I think you'll back me up on this. Nine tenths of economics, maybe ninety nine percent of economics, is not competition; it's cooperation. Cooperation is the fundamental principle of economics. The more we cooperate, the more we are all better off. So I don't like the approach that, that Trump is taking, but I, I, I don't, um, uh, I don't, uh, I'm not mystified by it. Okay. So just a couple more questions. So sure. partway through your visit to the People's Republic of California, <laughs> which certainly has a different feel and perspective than what you might see on the Fox News. Um, do you have any impressions? How is it different you're here this time? What, what, any views on California? Yeah, well, I think California is a good example of, um, of uh, overexpansion of the state, in this case at the state level. Uh, California, during its uh, years of tremendous economic growth, um, it, 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 it sort of you know, post-World War II, 50s and 60s. The, the, the state of California undertook 
to do a lot of wonderful things. A fabulous transit system, a terrifically generous pension program for its, uh, a university system unequaled in the world. Uh, there was never any thought uh, in California that, uh, that, that every time you create a government program, it be begins a, a process of infinite expansion. And I, I don't think California foresaw that, for one thing, that its, that its economy could change in its nature, might slow down, that the population of the state would grow uh, enormously, and that a lot of people in that enormous population growth might not have the set of skills that, 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 that brought ca California either its original prosperity um, or, or its, its future prosperity. Um, government programs are by their nature rigid, and this is especially true of anything that, that falls into the entitlement category. It is very hard. When Social Security was created by the federal government, people lived to be, people retired at 65 and then they died five months later. Bonk, you know, they were out, you know. People lived to be 62, you know, and that was that. Now that people live to be 102, you know, the, the whole system doesn't work. Medicare the same way, even in the 1960s. People, by the 1960s, see, I can, I can forgive S Social Security because they really didn't understand uh, a lot of actuarial statistics very well back in the 1930s. By the 1960s, when, when Medicare comes along, they had the kind of actuarial information to project what this population, they, they, they knew that medical advances had happened and more were on the way, they could foresee that the population of old people being served by Medicare uh, was going to grow, uh, uh, maybe not as enormously as it did, but they could foresee that. When you craft these government entitlement programs, you have to be very careful about what the actuarial realities are, are going to be. And California really dropped the ball uh, in that respect. They, they thought there was like an endless pool uh, they thought, like the 49ers, you know, who founded the state, they thought there was an endless amount of gold, and there just wasn't. Okay. Well, unfortunately, we've reached the point in our program where there's only time for uh, one more question, and I, I wanted to ask you, you're, you know, a large part of the way through your book tour, so have a little more time in California, and then you're going to go back to your lovely home state of New Hampshire. And besides taking a nap, yes, exactly, um, always good. <laughs> what else is in the in the future for you? What are you going to be doing after your after? What what should we be looking for next from PJ O'Rourke? Well, that's uh, here's where I get to plug my magazine. Uh, I have a free online. A uh, magazine called American Consequences. It's sponsored. There's an investment advisory company down in Baltimore called Stansbury Research, and they've kind of turned me loose with this monthly magazine, which we are doing as most th th that we can to uh, make it like the good and interesting and 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 and, and beautiful looking. Um, and sort of controversial uh, magazines of the past. Uh, and we're having an enormous amount of fun with it. I commend uh, it to you. It won't cost you anything. Um, on the other hand, once you, once you open it up, it'll probably never go away either, you know? So I, mean, I, you know, I, I confess to that. Uh, but I don't think it'll do any harm. Uh, we're, we're not spying on you or anything. And so it's just, you know, we're, we're having some fun with, with, with business. And, and, you know, we're doing a... Uh, a politics issue that will be out in the uh, middle of next month, uh, uh, you know, where we're loaning politics. But one of the big points to it is that politics doesn't, or s some of our experts say, politics doesn't affect the uh, really fund the fundamentals of e economics. And it, no matter what happens in the in the midterm, it is not going to be able to destroy the boom that we have going on right now. Our November issue is about the crash. <laughs> <laughs> inevitably happen after this boom <laughs> and should you be burying Krugerrands in the yard <laughs> so, so we're having fun you know and, 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 and it gives a, a, an opportunity for a lot of people um, like lawyers financial analysts tend to be good writers they, they really do you have to be clear with this that they don't have much of a chance to write for fun and it's always you know you know purpose directed writing and so we get to tap into uh, one of my Favorite contributors is an anonymous friend of mine, and not the anonymous from the New York, not that guy, you know? Because, oh, incidentally, I'm anonymous. I just wanted to announce that, because I, 
I want the book contract. You know, you say, well, PJ, you're not a, a, a high government official. I say, no, but I'm a journalist, and anybody a journalist talks to as a source becomes a high government official, <laughs> highly placed government official. Have you ever seen anything sourced to a lowly placed government official? <laughs> Middling government official, you know, like kind of important, but not really. Uh, 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 no, it's always a, a, a senior government, senior uh, uh, administration official, and I want that book contract from uh, an anonymous is going to get. But anyway, I've got this great guy who's... Uh, uh, he's the chief risk officer for a big insurance company, and he gets to let his hair down in, in, in the magazine. Uh, we have to conceal his identity, uh, lest uh, uh, his life insurance get canceled or something. But, <laughs> but anyway, it's fun to hear what a risk officer what really thinks sure. is risky, you know, which is everything, incidentally. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. So where, where would people find the magazine? How do they get You just Google uh, American Consequences, and there it is. Okay. American Consequences. Yeah. So uh, you heard it here first. The author of Anonymous is sitting here yes. with us. <laughs> so, um, but please uh, give a warm Commonwealth round of applause for PJ O'Rourke. Thank you. Thank you very much. So again, PJ O'Rourke is, uh, as we all know, a wonderfully interesting man and author of this new book, None of My Business. We also want to thank everyone here, as well as our audience on radio, television, and the internet. And as a reminder for those of you who are here, uh, that copies of Mr. O'Rourke's new book are on sale, and I'll be pleased to sign them outside the room following the program. So again, I'm Lenny Mendonca, and now this meeting of the Commonwealth Club, the place where you're in the know, is adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.